Have you ever thought about how our emotions or what's going on in our brain might be impacting our physical body? Or on the flip side, how how our hair or skin appears or the size of our body or the shape of our face and how that might be impacting our self-esteem and from there our mental wellness? These are questions that haunt me a lot. I am a scientist and a dermatologist and I've spent my entire career helping people heal and helping them understand this tight interaction between our inner and outer selves. Uh, years ago, decades ago, scientists began to study how a thought or an emotion causes the release of neurochemicals in our brain and how these neurochemicals leave the nervous system and impact a wide variety of body systems, systems such as our gut system, our pulmonary system, our immune system, and our integumentary system. Our integumentary system is our skin and our hair. And uh, yet, most of us, don't, on an everyday basis, think about how the thoughts that are going through our mind might be affecting our physical bodies. And this is reinforced, really, by the way that we practice medicine in the United States, at least. It is a very body-focused system, <clears throat> and especially the, the way that we practice medicine through insurance. Doctors become basically mechanics to treat the body, and we give drugs and injections and uh, procedures to get that body well. And very little is generally, unless of course we're a psychiatrist, put into emphasizing the emotional aspects of uh, diseases. And yet, fundamentally, we do, we are thinking emotional beings residing within a physical body. Now, I think it goes without saying that the advent of social media and the selfie phenomenon over the last couple of decades has made a tremendous impact on the psyche of our society as a whole, and in particular on our young people, uh, with the plethora of selfie filters and influencers and others out there telling us what fits in and what doesn't fit in and what looks good and what doesn't look good. And this has uh, created uh, anxiety and depression and bullying at rates that have never before been seen. Um, as such, we have in a way separated physically from our emotional selves and have in a way forgotten how absolutely beautiful it is to have a sense of self-confidence or how much people who are, are imbued with joy or kindness or peace are and how this is contributing to our outer beauty. And so I first got interested in this interaction between the brain and our body at a very young age when I was in high school. When I was 16 years old, I got a job working in a neurobehavioral uh, lab at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. And we were studying how animals who were performing certain behaviors, uh, pushing on a lever to receive a pellet of food, how this caused the release of a neurochemical that would then impact the animal's uh, endocrine system, hormonal system, or their immune system. And this was the start of a very early and now well-established field um, called psychoneuroendocrine immunology, a big word, but it's basically talking about the orchestration of all these chemicals and how, how all of uh, different parts of our body are talking to each other all the time. Now later when I was working on my PhD work, I was in an immunology lab and I was looking at uh, molecules and how it affected the growth of certain immune cells, T cells in particular. And I chose a molecule called prolactin. And normally this molecule was thought by um, people in medicine to only be involved in the release of milk from a mother who had given, had a newborn baby. And basically the mother would cry, or the baby would cry, and it would stimulate the release of this molecule prolactin. Uh, from the mother's brain, and it would go to her breast and, and her milk would let down. And lo and behold, I was able to show that this molecule um, worked in the immune system in a totally different way, helping those cells proliferate and grow. Um, when I got into dermatology later, 
I discovered that there was a whole subset of skin and hair disorders that actually were only there because of what was going on in, in the mind of the person that had it. An example is called delusions of uh, parasitosis. So um, in every other way, these individuals uh, who are perfectly normal except for the very strong and deeply held belief that there are bugs crawling all over their skin. And they start scratching and picking at their skin and create lesions um, that look like horrible infections when in fact this is all their own self um, creation. These individuals don't need creams or antiparasitic medications to help them out. They need help with their mental condition, which is the subset of an obsessive compulsive disorder. And when that's taken care of, all of a sudden their skin goes back to normal. Another example is trichotillomania. This is a condition that affects people, predominantly young people, um, who are under great anxiety. And as a relief to the anxiety, they pull out their hair and they end up with bald patches all over their scalp or their eyelashes gone or their eyebrows gone. And um, when that anxiety is, is relieved, then they will actually have the hair grow back. So this balance between our emotional and physical selves is real. And I think that most of us would get it that if you have a person who is mentally intact, um, but then has a big uh, event happen to their appearance, that this might affect their self-esteem and their mood would go down. Now, is the opposite also true? Can you take somebody who has a primary um, Im illness or impairment with their mental health and improve their physical appearance and help their mood? And the answer is actually interestingly yes. Some progressive psychiatrists are helping their depressed patients by borrowing some treatments that we use in cosmetic dermatology. They are taking Botox and using that, Botox is a brand name for a neurotoxin that can relax the muscles that are creating the furrow between the brow and giving somebody the appearance that they're frowning. So when they treat their depressed patients with Botox and erase that line, these patients who were before getting a biofeedback when they looked at themselves in the mirror and seeing the frown, that they were unhappy and sad, when that disappears, they now get a new messaging coming into their brain, and that is, I'm not so sad, I'm not so mad, and I actually look happy. And this, the psychiatrists are finding, is able to help these individuals um, get, get more improvement in their overall condition. Now let's talk about acne. This is a condition that affects young people a lot, but in fact, it affects 90 to 85% of the whole human population. This is the most common dermatological condition that is seen in humans. And it will affect uh, us to, to certain degrees at certain points in our lives. So it, it will, there is a big blip that happens during adolescence, but it can happen really at any age. And acne often will strike us at emotionally vulnerable times. Um, certainly this is a condition that has a lot of uh, both emotional and physical um, impact on our appearance. And because it affects our appearance, it does have this strong emotional overlay. Now, despite being common, this disease is incredibly complex. And because of that, it comes in multiple different clinical expressions. I like to tell my patients there's at least 20 different expressions of acne. And um, because of that, the disease needs to be managed with what's called polytherapy or multiple medications or hammers to address all the things going on biologically to get it to behave itself. Even so, this is not a one drug wonder and nor is it an overnight sensation. It takes a while for it to get better. And um, even people that are on uh, good medications, if they're not on the right medications to treat the right expression of the acne, they really won't get better. So poorly treated acne or inappropriately treated acne on average has an 11 year lifespan. And unfortunately, if it is not treated well, all during that time, people can lay down both physical scars as well as emotional scars. Now, 
the emotional impact of acne is not a one-to-one -one correlation with the severity of the disease. Interestingly enough, you can have somebody with very mild disease having a very severe emotional reaction to it, or the opposite, somebody with very severe disease is not really bothered by it that much. Um, there have been many clinical reports um, that have uh, equated the emotional impact of acne on adolescents to be as strong as the diagnosis of epilepsy or diabetes mellitus or even cardiovascular disease. So this disease needs to be treated as a whole person disease, both physical and emotional, in order for people to get better. And we need to use medications that are appropriate for the type of uh, acne that the person is expressing. And there are many diseases that actually look like acne, but really aren't acne itself. So there is, uh, there is importance to being able to give a proper diagnosis. Now, unfortunately, the state of the art of of medicine today in our insurance system doesn't allow for this whole person care. Um, I like to say dermatology is still in the dark ages <laughs> in many sense um, because the doctors are, are working in a system that really doesn't honor the needs of the disease. Um, within the insurance system, the insurance system being a monetized business, doctors are, um, are are treating this disease as if it is somewhat of a cosmetic disease. They, um, insurance tends to belittle acne and other diseases that affect primarily our appearance and are not systemic uh, diseases. In other words, they don't harm the rest of our body um, as, as somewhat trivial. Um, and so what happens is a doctor is not reimbursed well to see a person with acne and even when a person comes to see a dermatologist after waiting sometimes for months and months to get in to see a dermatologist, because dermatologists are sort of a, a very small segment of all the doctors around, um, what happens is the doctor might only give them 10 minutes or so. And they write them a prescription and off they go. Now, with regards to the medicines that the doctors are allowed to use within the insurance system, there is something called a formulary that the doctors can work within. And this formulary has tiers. Um, tier one is what people can generally afford and what doctors are allowed to just give to the patients. Um, tier three are the much more expensive but modern medications, um, and the doctors often have to get prior authorization, which can take months, or are denied those medications for these patients. Um, and so the formulary in tier one are old generics that have been around now for decades. And there's a handful of topicals that patients can cycle through. And um, then they often give oral antibiotics that they need to use for um, months and often years, which is contributing to the global drug resistance. And, um, and or they're put on much more um, potentially serious side effect um, acting drugs like isotretinoin or Accutane. Um, and what's, what happens is because this formulary list is so, is so small, the patients are often kind of treated as a one size fits all. And um, when that happens, people tend to fail. And sadly, um, the failure rate for uh, traditional medications for acne is up towards 80%. And when people fail again and again, they don't understand that the system has failed them and, that, and instead they look at it as themselves being the failure, which contributes to the negative emotional impact. Now, in steps technology, and awesome, technology is great, but what has happened is most of the online teledermatology offerings that are out there have actually emulated Dermatology 1.0. And what has happened is that the patients often are, it, it's great that they can access care faster because that is one of the hurdles, but what they often are doing are self-diagnosing themselves. Okay, I'm here for acne, and like I said before, there are other diseases that could look like acne but not really be acne and need quite different medications. Um, but the other thing is that the medications that are offered through these um, online offerings, which are basically just a drug, um, uh, drug-centric offering, they are the repackaging of these generics that have been around for decades. They're just in fancier packages. So the patient who's failed once before with the brick and mortar system 
is now failing again with the online. So the patient really feels like they're a loser now. Um, so what we need now is a new way, <laughs> a new way to help these people better because um, given the, uh, the anxiety and the self-esteem aspects that are going on with our youth, we need to offer people that are suffering from this very, very common disease a better way to manage it. And that is by acknowledging both the physical and the aspects of it, something that I call Dermatology 2.0, or whole person care. And we need to do it with much more sophistication. Now, Part of that sophistication is using technology and having us let these patients who are so common have greater access to care. And we can do that through online offerings, through uh, teledermatology. Uh, but what we need to do is, uh, is provide a very customized diagnosis and have this be a system that is designed by a dermatologist who knows how to to uh, properly diagnose these, these cases, but match that particular expression of acne with modern medicines. Modern medicines that are topical, that are safe, and can be pr provided in combination such that we will be able to get this disease to behave itself faster. And in combination with this, we need to be able to have empathy and let these people know that their feelings matter guide them through a journey to better healing in a whole person way um, and provide them information um, about their disease so that there's no surprises and that they can have what um, I call a healthy outcome for both our mental and our physical selves so that we can unshackle these people from the burdens, sometimes lifelong, that acne can lay down. And um, as all of us know, happy people lead to happy lives. And um, we are indeed more than skin deep.